Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Art of Photography. My name is Ted Forbes and I am back from Baltimore this week and it has been a whirlwind. And for those of you who have emailed and tweeted and stuff and said, hey, what about a Baltimore meetup? I'm sorry we didn't get to that. Um, I was on a business trip and time was just too tight, but I promise next time I come back we will do one. Uh, Baltimore is a wonderful city. Um, it is a beautiful place to take photographs, a lot of cool stuff to see. Hope I can get some of my stuff up pretty soon on that rather than just the Instagram stuff that I normally do um, when I'm traveling, but uh, get some of my more serious photos up as well but anyway a wonderful city I had a great time and it was really cool um, I want to follow up uh, two episodes ago we did an episode on Vivian Mayer and I mentioned at the top of the episode if you've seen it that I haven't I've kind of avoided covering her for a while now and one of the main reasons for that is because you know my opinions I believe are a little bit controversial about Miss Mayer's work. And surprisingly, um, the well, or maybe not surprisingly, I, the overwhelming response was generally pretty positive. I didn't get a lot of hate mail on that like I thought I would've. Uh, there were a couple of people who argued with me and somebody in comments on YouTube who just flat out got furious with me. But you know what, it's okay. And we're all titled to our own opinions on things and certainly not offended by that. And I'm sorry that individual was. But uh, anyway, um, but what I wanna follow up and say on that is what I find fascinating, and I'm really glad that I covered Vivian Mayer because it's brought up a lot of other questions um, in terms of, I think just the basic premise that you have a photographer who was completely unknown, who did this large body of work that was discovered by somebody. Um, and so there, I'd like to revisit this and we will in the future on future episodes because there's a lot of interesting discussion on this. Um, you know, there was, somebody had mentioned uh, you know, had brought up the fact that actually they went to the Museum of Modern Art in New York who weren't interested at all in it, and I'll go into it later, but you know, that's not exactly where I would take a body of work by an obscure street photographer. But, um, you know, uh, there's questions about curation, there's questions about, you know, how work gets into a museum, there's questions about copyright, there's questions about Vivian Mayer, and, and you know, here's the deal. If you like her work, you like her work, and I think that's outstanding, and that goes for any photographer. But my only point was, you have a photographer specifically that's being exploited to a great deal right now uh, for financial gain and personally I just think that of that era and of that oeuvre of street photography or that social documentary or whatever you want to call it I think there's so many important names that people just ignore or don't know about or gloss over because this is what's being marketed right now and I guess that was my point and I guess it's not that angry or dark or whatever and there's nothing to apologize for but anyway I do want to revisit uh, Vivian Mayer as a topic because I think there's a lot of cool discussion that is, you know, that comes out of that. And so we'll hit on that uh, in the future as well, just to let you know it's coming up. So for today, though, um, I have an idea. We have not covered in a while. Um, you know, we kind of do different series and stuff um, with this show. And one thing we haven't done is anything that's kind of like fundamental to becoming a better photographer. Um, and I, I did that for a while and then I got out of it because I think the photo lit thing is so important and I think it's important for you guys to know photographers who are out there. Um, I think it's important even if it's a photographer you know, like somebody who's more popular we've covered like Sally Mann or Vivian Mayer for that matter, um, to go in and actually look at their work uh, from an objective standpoint and understand what it is that makes the work, what it is that makes the composition interesting, what it is that makes their vibe as a photographer important and you know base your opinions off of some things like that and you know from some of the feedback I've got uh, on this I think that some people it's like you know there's somebody that they have were familiar with but if they've been able to see in a new light and I think that's really important I think that's really cool and that's what makes photography so interesting so what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch gears a little bit today and I want to cover um, I've narrowed this down to three things but we're gonna do three topics here today um, that we're gonna kind of go through but these are three things they're three tips that you can apply to today or this week or whatever you want that are going to improve your photography skills. And I find it interesting when people do these three things to make you a better photographer and then you look at it and it's like, okay, well, people already knew that stuff. But and so I want to approach this a little bit more from the standpoint that I did a couple years ago when we did the composition, or not the composition, sorry, the Masterclass Live that was about, you know, um, your personality as a photographer. And so it relates a little bit to that. Uh, but let me get my notes here and we'll flip it around a little bit and let's cover the three things that you can do this week that are going to start improving your skills as a photographer. Okay, so three things that you can do this week to start improving your photography skills. And I hope that um, you'll actually start applying some of these. A lot of these are more mental than anything else. And I think that is the most important and the most missing link with what we see with, you know, the way people approach photography today. It becomes very equipment focused and not enough, you know, thought is put into it. So this is what I want to talk about. So step one, and this is the, the first 
um, tip for improving your skills as a photographer. The first is to narrow the focus. When you say, I want to get better as a photographer, that is such a broad statement. And so I think the first thing that most people, you know, it's, it's, it's weird that a lot of things that are so obvious about photography, like learning how to see things and learning how to look at things. Well, you think, well, I shouldn't have to learn how to look at something. I know how to see, I know how to look at things. But it's amazing how hard some of these things are. And so I think the first step of this, when I say narrow your focus, um, is to determine what it is you want to get better at. I think that's the first thing. Um, I have a friend that years ago um, got way back into photography and he was the kind of guy who would get bored and want to go out and go somewhere and shoot all the time. And while that was fun and I did a lot of that with him, um, I think that some of it is just this, this thought that I just need to get out and see something different. And you know, that could hold true on some level. But I think the first step is just rather than say I'm gonna get out and shoot, I think the, the more important way of looking at this is to narrow your focus and decide what is it that you want to do. Who are your heroes as photographers? What kind of styles of photography, um, you know, kind of entice you and make you interested in kind of maybe going that direction or learning that style of shooting? And so this could be, uh, you know, anything from, you know, let's say you're a big Vivian Mayer fan or you're a big Henri Cartier-Bresson fan, or maybe you like Gregory Crudson. And those are very different styles of photography, particularly those last two people I mentioned. Um, if you look at somebody like Gregory Crudson, and I'll link to him in the show notes, so go check those out at theartofphotography.tv. Um, anyway, Gregory Crudson does these, if you're not familiar with him, um, he's an amazing photographer. He's one of the hot names in contemporary art right now. Um, I've met him before, he's an amazing person, really nice guy, and he does this fabulous work where each shot is these, you know, it's kind of a high conceptual, uh, kind of an urban landscape of sorts, but with people involved. And it's like, they're like movie scenes and they're set up like that. Uh, a lot of them are sometimes both outdoors and indoors and they have, uh, you know, very involved complex lighting to them. And, you know, they're, they're really like a movie still. And the production that goes into making these images is much like that too. So that's one very specific style of photography. If that's your thing and that's what you're into, then you need to kind of start figuring out how you can start shooting that kind of work and what scale to do that on and so a lot of this is the thought of determining what goes into it but you can't do that until you narrow it down on the other end of the spectrum I mentioned Henri Cartier-Bresson who was a one of the great street photographers uh, social documentary photographer um, war journalist um, and um, but his whole thing was the decisive moment and being able to improvise within a structure and we're gonna talk about that in a second because that comes under one of the other tips that I've got this is the end um, but anyway so Bresson was about getting out he was about getting out there and shooting but finding people and finding situations and then paying attention enough as a photographer, and we'll come back to this when we talk about improvisation in a second, but you know, finding that decisive moment, and that's what made him so good. Um, sometimes it may have been a little more composed, sometimes it may have been more improvised, but that's the kind of photography he did. And if you're interested in that style of shooting, then those are the situations you wanna start looking for. So that's tip one, is to narrow your focus. If you wanna do still lifes, then you need to start setting up still lifes and figure out, you know, do I wanna shoot flowers? Do I wanna shoot food? Do I want, you know, what is that that you wanna shoot? Uh, maybe you wanna do portraits. Well, start looking at great portrait photographers and do you want to do you know headshots because you know that's one thing but then there's people like Arnold Newman who you can look at that that did these environmental portraits and the whole picture told the viewer something about the person's personality he was photographing so anyway it can go pretty deep but the first step is to narrow your focus and figure out what it is that you want to do and what road you want to go down and maybe it's experimental. Maybe you do a lot of street photography, but you'd like to go over and try the more crude and like set up scenes. And so, you know, that could be a focus as well. Or maybe it's an experiment and it's a road you want to go down that might come back to improving the, the skills that you already have as a photographer in something else. So anyway, narrow your focus is the first one I would recommend. The second one, and I like this one because it's, it, it should be more obvious as well. Shoot less, think more or think more and shoot less, however you want to uh, take that. Um, my day job, most of you know, I work at an art museum. And the department that I have is digital media, and one of the things we oversee is event photography. I shoot events sometimes, and I have other people that shoot events as well. And one of the things that, that I think is the challenge of that is it's one thing to go out to an event, shoot, let's say you shoot weddings or something, and you go fire off and you come back with 3,000 images uh, for the bride and the groom to cull through later, or, you know, and sometimes it's like, wow, did you really need that many images or could it, the story have been told in a lot less? And so I think this comes down to um, the case of quality over quantity, certainly. But think more and shoot less. And I think that a lot of people, they get into a situation 
and they start photographing away. And their shots they're missing because they're too involved with the viewfinder and the camera and what's going on. Um, it's almost like they're afraid they're gonna miss something and thus they end up missing something. And I'll give you um, an example. Um, this week we did, a couple episodes ago, I did the behind the scenes on the New York thing and we've been working on this exhibition of Islamic art that has opened. And we had a luncheon um, that was followed by a tour and we had a very distinguished guest, was the former first lady, Laura Bush, uh, was there. And so I was one of the photographers that was shooting on this. And one of the things that, and I think this carries over into what I'm talking about here, is you want to look for the opportunities where you're gonna get good shots, particularly if there's very important people involved. And I think the other thing too is, is I try to approach this with a mindset of where are they gonna be next? And so, you know, in this case, it's a tour of an exhibition. And I might not be able to cram in and get close enough because I don't want to disturb the, the, there were about 40 people on this tour. So it was a small group, but it was big enough to where people are gathered around and you don't want to ruin their experience, certainly by trying to capture photos. So if there's a case where you can't get in and get the right shot, be thinking ahead. What room are they going in next? Where are they going to move to next? And try to beat them there so you can set up. And you know, some of it's a crapshoot because you're just in your mind trying to determine what's going to happen. But I ended up getting better shots doing that than I would if I were just simply kind of following around and just firing off, you know, machine gun style. And so it's all about thinking before you shoot. Um, I think another example of something like this, let's say that you like doing landscapes or something of that nature, and you are shooting these rolling hills or whatever the, the scene is, you know, um, and thinking to yourself, and I covered this when we did the Masterclass Live, is understanding, okay, is this the right time for the perfect picture? Is this that decisive moment? And sometimes it's like, what are the weather conditions? Is the sun in the right place? What would happen if I came back and shot this in the evening rather than the morning? What would happen if I shot this when the weather was slightly different and there were clouds in the sky? Or what if I waited until I got a rainy day? Or, you know, all these situations where you want to think through that and what is going to pay off in the end is a much better photograph because you've thought through it. So think more, shoot less is the key on that. And then finally, Finally, the last one I want to talk about, and this is a fun topic for me because I have a music background, and understanding improvisation and what that means. This is the third one, so understanding improvisation. By this, if you look at some of the great jazz musicians, and this is the example I love to give on this because I, you know, I love the music of Miles Davis and John Coltrane and a lot of those guys and the, that golden age of, of jazz, especially with you know, this cool period of music that Miles Davis brings out with uh, you know, things like Kind of Blue. And, a lot of jazz in, is set up in a structure that allows for a great deal of improvisation. So within a, a band setting, somebody like Miles Davis, they will come out and they'll play the melody and then they will improvise over the chord changes of the song and then they usually play the melody and you're out. That's basic structure. And sometimes improvisation can be little things like taking the melody and doing just little different things with it. Something that's pre-written, but you're putting your own stamp on it by, you know, kind of taking a little bit different avenue, adding some notes to embellish, not straying too far, but that is a type of improvisation. And then there's the solo that might come in the middle of the song uh, with the structure where you're improvising with the chord changes. Now, I think that just as observers or as listeners, when you hear the end product and you know a little bit about jazz, there tends to be this moment where, I, you know, and I did this when I was a lot younger too, where you like to believe that especially somebody, a great like Miles Davis comes along and they're basically just, you know, the, the, the music is coming to them and it's coming out through the trumpet or whatever that is, uh, whatever the instrument is. And, you know, there's this, this flow that comes from a higher power or something. And that is true to an extent, but what improvisation really is and what great musicians like Miles Davis too is they're not just doing whatever in there. There usually is some kind of relationship to the melody of the song that's coming out. Of course, it's going to be way more embellished, but there might be certain notes that are important because they were in the melody. Um, and then also understanding um, what notes are appropriate to play over a set of chord changes. And I use jazz music as the example here because usually you have a lot of key changes and the music can go in a lot of different directions and there's a great deal of understanding music theory and understanding uh, the song, understanding how all this works to put it together. So in a way this divine thing is sort of flowing through them but it's not selecting all the notes all the time. Because if you just did, I mean, if, I guess there's free jazz if you want to make that association, but, and you could even analyze that. But my point is, is that improvisation is an act of acting in the moment based on your experience before that's led up to that point. 
And so in the case of being a jazz musician, it's the music theory you've learned. It's the fact you've played that tune probably several hundred times before. You understand the chord changes. You understand what it's going to do. Based on those things and based on knowing what notes will work, what scales will work, what are the notes of the chords that you want to embellish, then you put the divine thing on top of that and that becomes a well improvised solo. I think the same thing applies to photography. I think that photography, especially if you consider like the Bresson decisive moment kind of thing, um, it is a decisive moment, but, and you could say that that moment is whatever the shutter speed might be, so 1 60th of a second or something like that. But I think it's more than that. It's 1 60th of a second plus, in Bresson's case, 20 or 30 years of photographs that have come before that. And that's how great artists, whether they're musicians or photographers, work, is you are always a culmination of all those things that come before you. So don't be afraid to practice. Don't be afraid to get out there and shoot, even though they're probably not photos you're ever gonna wanna use or something, but maybe you're, for instance, like with Decisive Moment, for instance, you need to be comfortable being up close with people. And so doing that a lot, and it's gonna yield some bad results a lot of the time, it's okay because you're gonna get better at it, and those things start adding up and they culminate into this final experience. And so you can't have that culminated experience if you don't have the practice and the things that go before that. So I guess this works on a number of levels and this really should be its own show, but when you're improvising or you're making something happen spur of the moment, it is a culmination of those things. It is the sum of all the parts and you have to make the mistakes and do all those parts to get to that point, if that makes sense. And so if you are in a point where you feel like you're in a creative rut or you're maybe discouraged a little bit, understand that it's all gonna go somewhere. What you wanna do is get out of that rut and if there's something you don't like about your work, you need to determine the focus and that goes back to number one on here was narrow your focus. And you need to understand what it is that you don't like that's happening and start finding ways to make that change. And you know, this is all easier said than done, obviously. It's one thing if I sit up here and blow hot air at you for 20 minutes or whatever the video is. And it's another thing to actually get out and apply these things and start learning. So we've covered three things here and they're all pretty broad and they're all kind of conceptual and they're all a little bit heady in some ways. But the easiest thing to do is just take one thing and apply that this week. And maybe that's just narrowing your focus or maybe that's um, understanding, you know, practicing for this thing of in, improvisation or maybe it is improvisation or maybe it's just shooting less and thinking more or, you know, Gosh, sometimes I think too, it, it's interesting because there's so many situations, especially when I'm just shooting freely and it's not for an assignment, it's just work for myself, that I'll actually get the camera all set and I've actually not taken the shot before because it wasn't right. And that's a real kind of, I don't mean that to sound arrogant or goofy or you know snooty or anything like that, but it's all a matter of understanding that you know pushing the button does not ensure that you get a good photograph. Understanding exposure, understanding situation, understanding what people are doing, understanding what light is doing, understand what a landscape is doing. Those are all the important things. And so I think just find one of these things and start applying it this week and then take it a step further the next week. Take it a step further the next week. K keep notes, write down what you're doing so you don't forget or, or get lazy and, and it goes away. But these are the things that are gonna make you a better photographer. They're not gonna be what kind of camera do you own. They're not gonna be they're really not going to even be, you know, what your aperture set out or what your exposure. Sometimes it's, you're not even in focus, you know, it's, it's like the, the Vivian Mayer image I showed two weeks ago that I really like a lot with the woman in the white dress that's walking away from the camera. It's not in focus and it's a beautiful image and it doesn't matter. And that's the important part is transcending those elements that are just fundamentals of how a camera works and being able to take it into that fourth dimension that's a theater term and it's real silly, but, but you know what I mean. You want to take it beyond and do something different that's very unique with it. So I hope that helps you. And those are your three tips for coming, becoming a better photographer this week. Okay, so there you have it. And I know this was kind of a cram and this is why, you know, a couple years ago when I did the Masterclass Live videos and there were four of them, they were each an hour long. Um, that's a better format for that because I can really dig deeper. But I wanted to give you just something today to kind of apply to that. Now, having said that, moving forward, I need your help and I'm interested in what you guys would like to see on this. And what I would like you to do is if there's something, a particular skill that you're trying to improve on or if there's something you're interested in learning that you don't have access to knowing how to begin with, 
um, ask me those questions. You can email me directly. I'm happy to share my email address here. It's no one got hurt at gmail.com. It's no one got hurt at gmail.com. And you know, send me some ideas if there's anything you guys want to see on this. Now, let me give you an example. What I would suggest you not do, <laughs> and I do get these kinds of emails all the time, is say, you know, hey, dear Ted, I'm a street photographer, and what do you think about the new? whatever camera model here, Panasonic, Sony, Nikon, Canon, DX, 1700D, B4, version two, and would that be the right camera you'd recommend for street photography? And you know, here's the deal, as I've said today, um, I think that the medium that you choose, whether that's digital, whether that's medium format, large format, 35 mil, whatever, Polaroid, uh, you know, it is important to an extent, but it is really not about improving what you're doing as a photographer. And when I mean it's important to an extent, it's a pretty easy thing to figure out. So let me give you an example here. For instance, um, you take somebody like Ansel Adams who did these beautiful black and white landscapes. And if you've ever actually seen Ad Ansel Adams prints in person, and I'm not talking about a book, I have not seen a book to date that captures the magic that one of those prints has. And there's a level of sharpness and detail in these beautiful tonal ranges. And he could not get that if he weren't using large format. He probably could, but it wouldn't have the same impact. So that's where medium comes into play. Um, let's take the opposite end, 180. You look at somebody like Terry Richardson, who has a really kind of cheesy lo-fi look and kind of brought back this aesthetic or brought this aesthetic of, you know, really lo-fi bad photography as being cool. Well, you know, he's not going to shoot on a digital camera or probably a large format or something like that. He's going to use a point and shoot 35 mil with the flash right in your face so it gets that look. And he created a whole look into fashion that was like that. So, you know, medium is important to a degree but it's not everything. In fact, it's just such a small um, percentage of what we're looking at overall in photography. So, you know, I'm talking about getting into the art behind things, getting into, and if some of you find art to be a pretentious word, I understand, but you know, what goes into composition, what goes into personality, what goes into, you know, ensuring that you have your own stamp on things and your personality comes through and your uniqueness as a photographer. So anyway, that's all I have to say on that. So email me if you've got uh, suggestions or questions on that because we're putting together a group of episodes moving forward as we get into the late spring here. And um, anyway, so I'll be happy to take suggestions on that. Anyway, once again, guys, thank you once again for watching The Art of Photography. I'll see you guys next week. Later.